We just want to say this. Thank you for attending this year's sixth annual Black and Brown Male Summit. You guys have a good day. Well, so first, my name is Rashad Norris, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at Highline College. And we're here today with a few young brothers that go to school here, um, attend here as um, students, and also work here. So I will allow them to introduce themselves. And then today, what we're going to do is have a round table conversation, or not even a round table conversation, but a conversation just around what does it mean to be a young man of color in today's world, plus um, give you a snapshot of the Black and Brown Male Summit that is now its sixth year in the making here at Highline College and where we started from and why we started that summit and with these individuals who attended the summit what did they see um, come out of the summit for these young men who are participants in our local school district so I'll let you I'll allow you to start. Hi my name is Notorious Ezel I'm the program assistant for the Black and Mosier cohort and I'm also the intern uh, assistant for a sociology uh, department and um, I just um, I attended the black and brown summit I think like two years ago like as being a caucus leader and just heavily involved with these young men so that's my role here on campus mm -hmm. right. I'm Josephus Tolo um, this is my second year here at Highland Community College or Highland College should I say and I'm also an employee here at Highland and I'm also going to be talking about what it feels like to be a person of color and I'm going to talk about the Black and Brown Summit too. My name is Christopher Robinson. I am a student here at Highline. <clears throat> I've been part of the Moja program. That's where I met Rashad Norris and uh, Ezel, or Notorious Ezel. So it's been cool being a part of this um, and having this journey and being a part of the Black and Brown Summit also. So just to get started, um, I've been here now at Highline for seven years and so We've, or eight years, I'm sorry. So this is the sixth year for the Black and Brown Male Summit. Um, the Black and Brown Male Summit, how this all came about was my second year um, as an employee here at Highline, I went down to a conference down in Florida. And it was called the Black and Brown College Bound Conference. And down in Florida, it was set up where the, the colleges worked together to put on this large summit that was a Thursday to a Saturday summit. And so they brought in all the college young men from the local colleges and to the to a hotel room, a hotel, and then did a large conference there where these students actually stayed the night over. And so when I came back up from that conference, a couple of colleagues of um, in mine, we came back up here with the idea to put together our own summit here at the college. So that's where the black and brown originated from. Um, two colleagues of mine, Natasha Burrow, she's no longer here, and then Aaron Reeder, who is no longer here as well. And so we came up with a blueprint. We presented it to the college, to exec staff, and to our president, to VP, and we brought it up here. So it being its sixth year, this is something that is special. It's been a part of Highline. It's been a part of the community. And let me just give you guys a, a little history of the Black and Brown Summit where we started out in 2011 with 35 students. It was maybe 35 to 30 students who showed up. Um, it was quite, um, it was an experience because we know that we're in the most diverse community in the state of Washington. So a summit such as this, I thought would speak volume to the communities and to the schools with having their students attend. Well, on that day, it didn't just, it just didn't happen like that. It was very, it was, it was a low turnout, but it was a good, it was the ones who showed up were supposed to be here. And just to bring you up to date, on the sponsorship with we had um, at the first con the first summit we had an achievement a dream which was an initiative that we had here at the college right. and they gave us like twenty thousand right. dollars and there was supposed to be buses that were supposed to bring students here to the campus but like like I said it just didn't happen like that right. um, we're in our sixth year we have over 500 students here now um, we have grown with our number of workshops we had like four to five our first year now we have up like to eight to thirteen and so our numbers are continuing to grow. There's p individuals that are now helping out sponsoring us with doing um, the summit. Um, we have our foundation. We have our president's office. Um, also, we have our Rotary Club from Federal Way. They're also sponsoring. So we have many sponsors that are helping with uh, putting forth money 
to bring our students here to the campus. So it's, it's been a beautiful thing. Um, how we got to this number was I held little small summits, or not summits, but small little discussions with young men of color at these schools. And so that gave them a, a precursor of what was going to happen in November. And just so much with this story around the black and brown male summit. The reason why you're here, I would love to have you talk about what does it mean to be a young man of color in today's world? Because I know that, you know, there's a lot of um, not just scrutiny, but a lot of stereotypes going on. A lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, people have perceptions of what it means to be a young man of color. I know the reasons why I put this together, and I know the reasons why others who joined the team or the committee to put this together, I know why they've done it as well. But just coming from you two and from um, you as well, Izel, what is it that really just sticks to you about the responsibilities you have as a young man of color in today's world or today's society or even in your community? And I'll start with you, Tello. <clears throat> well, to start off, I'm a lot of things. I am a brother, I am a father, I am an uncle, and I have a lot of responsibilities. And I'm glad you brought that up because responsibility is something that's some, responsibility is something that we have to take care of. It's not something that we could put off and do something else. And growing up, my cultural background, um, I was born and raised in Africa, and I came here at the age of 11. So having those two atmospheres in two different environments, it has really changed my life. And I never knew how much of a value I was to my family, to my society, and to the whole world until an event took place that made me realize how important, how different I am from other people. Um, a perfect example was in Portland, I went to go eat with Christopher Robinson and Jordan Calloway. And as we entered the restaurant, we see that everybody else was seated eating their food and nobody was asked to pay first before they eat. However, us, um, the three of us was asked to pay first before we were even seated. And we caught that, but we didn't want it to blow, uh, blow out of proportion because we didn't know what was going on. So we went to the restroom and we were trying to figure out what was going on. And Christopher and I was asking people in the restroom, hey, did you guys pay first before you guys uh, was seated before you guys eat? And everybody was like, no, we didn't pay first. And I was like, hmm, that's weird. So Christopher took the initiative to go talk to the manager and he asked the manager, hey, how come you asked us to pay first before we, sit, we were seated to eat? And she played the innocent game. Oh, I didn't notice the policy, you know, we're busy. And then we asked her, are we the only people that you asked to pay first before you seat us down to eat? And she said, yes. And it was really shocking. It was really shocking because that was my first time in my whole entire life. I felt like I was not worthy of anything. I feel like just because the skin color of my tone, the color of my tone, I have, I've been discriminated against and I didn't understand. And we had money to pay and I didn't understand why it happened. And I felt like I didn't have any value. So after that event took place, it made me realize that there's a lot of things in this society nowadays that is going on. Especially being a black person, it's really hard because you're always a target, you're always a suspect. Anything that happens, people always point finger at you, like, oh, go check that person. And most cases, you're innocent. And I'm just a kid, just like everybody else, you know, 20 years old, still growing up, have a lot to look forward to. And that was my first experience that I had with racism and discrimination. So that was a really big eye opener for me. And that was when I was like, man, this is a serious topic and I need to address it. And we came back here to Washington and we told everybody that we knew about it. And that was just one thing that stood out to me that changed my life ever since then. Well, I mean, I feel like, uh you know, dealing with racism is, is, is one part of being a black man and part of growing up <clears throat> and being a person of color, I feel like I have a lot of responsibilities. You know what I mean? Um, I, have a lot of, I have a lot of things to make up for those of us who are accused of not doing it, right? Or, or just of how we're looked at. I feel like I almost have to step my game up and, and, and fight harder than the average person just because of the things that are you know, pushing against us. You know, one of those examples was, you know, when me and Josephus, we went to the restaurant and we were, you know, publicly discriminated against, you know. And growing up in, a, you know, state of Washington was like a, a hippie, a hippie, a hippie area, you know, in Seattle specifically. And getting outside of my bubble, right, to where, to areas where it's not as diverse, like Portland and being in Oregon, right, where they're pretty much known to be um, blatant about it. And, and it's not like, it's, it's not that other people don't think it, you know what I mean? It's just that they said it openly. And so being a person of color, I'm constantly feeling this 
type of interaction mm -hmm. with other people, right? And it's, it's, it's people of color too, you know? It's, I feel like I have to be more responsible because I'm already look at, looked at in a certain way, in a certain image, in a certain mirror. So I feel like that's why the Black and Brown Summit is so important because for one, when you're going through this type of, um, this type of, I don't wanna say persecution, but when you're, when, you're, when you're getting this type of pushback and you're experiencing these things, it can do a lot to you psychologically. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like one thing it can attack would be your, um, it can attack how you feel emotionally about yourself about your people, your surroundings. And I feel like that's, that's one thing that is, is, is tackling is, you know, when I, there at the restaurant, I mean, the food didn't taste as good. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm eating what I love to eat, but I, it's like I, I'm so emotionally conflicted and yeah. in, in, in how I've been disrespected that the food is kind of like, the food's not that good anymore. You know what I mean? And so we thought of a million and one things we could have done after the fact that we were there, never experiencing that type of, disrespect like that from uh, store managers and things like that but you know it's, it's definitely something that that's needed in our community and you can tell by the turnout I mean people show up because this is what we need mm -hmm. you know what I mean it's it's not something that we I don't feel like it's something that the community wants or something that we need and it's, it's very valuable and important so so me coming from I'm a little older than you guys me and Rashad the same no, age no. yeah yeah <laughs> um, my involvement in the black and brown and first, and to kind of, you know, talk about what Rashad said about how does it feel. Um, I had a situation and, you know, I didn't know that happened to you guys because I'm real close working with you guys and I didn't know that happened. And um, I had a, a situation maybe like a month ago that me and my daughter was in the car and um, I was driving my Cadillac and uh, the police saw me and they turned around in the middle of the street and got behind me. Now my license, my insurance, everything is okay, but they followed me. And so my daughter was, we was driving and they was following me everywhere I was going. I was like, and so my daughter bent down to do something. I was like, stop, stop. And she was like, why dad? And I was like, they're gonna pull up. She was like, but we're not doing anything. And so those post-traumatic things that happen, like as a result, like me being older than you guys, this stems from things that happen. I grew up in the South, I grew up in Alabama. And just things happening down there still to this day have me, you know, I work every day. I go to school. I have like I own my own home, you know, all these things. I'm a taxpayer. I vote all these things, but we'll still look at as being less than who we are. And so my daughter caught it right then. She mm. caught it. She was like, Dad, I didn't, you know, and it was a shock. And I was like, wow. I didn't been exposed to a lot of things in my life. Mm -hmm. And you guys are, and, and I'm still getting exposed to it. And so going through all that racism and th all that in the South growing up and then coming up here and then finding out about things like the Black and Brown Summit, mm -hmm. this, some of these things are not allowed in institutions down South. Mm -hmm. they, it's, it's pick and choose. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that got me like want to be very passionate about helping and, and that's what I told Rashad is like anything you need me to do I'll do it and one thing is because if it's a way for us to give back I have to be in that realm where I can help somebody else because I wasn't given the opportunity you know I'm able to see people like with the Moja and black and brown I'm able to see people like um, people that don't look like me still invest <laughs> in us and when you got people that are investing you you know mm -hmm. because that incident that happened with you guys, that was horrible, but then you come back and look on this end and you look at Rashad and look at what he's doing, you look at what we're doing and trying to give back to you and not just you guys, but the people <coughs> that are coming behind you, that's important. And so my years attending the Black and Brown, I, this, is like, this will be my third year, I just got on the committee and I'm looking forward to just being, you know, just getting in because I seen these young men during the summer. We was in, and I was a caucus leader last year and I saw these young men, like I was at a table with them and they like opened up about like every, like tell me what's going on. And a lot of times we don't know what's going on with these kids. Like why are, why are you in school? Like when you go to school, why are you tired? It's like, well, my teacher never asked because I was babysitting trying to help my mom out, keep my little brother and my little sister. And it's things like that that we never asked or they're never asked. And so these things are important and the black and brown gave them a window 
to like open up and we can work with them and try to help them in a ways and they need their voice. Like mm -hmm. our young men, all people, young people need their voice, but our young men of color, they really need their voice right now. So they no, that's good. That's good. And I was and, and let me just say this because I know that um I always I believe in team. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I believe in team. I believe that, you know, yes, one person can get things started, but the team is really that helps to push along and keep it going. So the committee members that have been a part of Black and Brown for the last seven years have been amazing. I mean, it's been amazing for these young people. And I just want to give kudos to all those who have been a part of the Black and Brown Male Summit and your work in the committee members, um, all of you who've been a part of it, the ones who, who started out, who have now gone on to do other things, but who just are still co uh, connected to the Black and Brown Male <coughs> Summit. It's, I just, we just thank you, I thank you. Um, it's been a, a great experience. I know we're gonna continue this going on. And I would just say, what really got me started in wanting to give back, and I remember in my, um, my master's program, um, I went to Evergreen State College for my MPA, and I put together a mentoring program. And I knew I always wanted to do work like this. This is something as, you know, people always say, you're passionate, Rashad. Right. Oh, you got a great passion for this. Right. And I tell people that, no, but this is my purpose. I'm supposed to do this, right. you know? And we all have read books, and I'm a big reader. And one, one book that I read, a person that I've idolized, is um, Nelson Mandela. Right. And he, you know, his saying is, each one teach one. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wrong for us as men of color who have had the privilege and the, the ability to, to navigate in such a society as we navigated in and became more educated with um, knowing what's around us and knowing why we move the way we move, um, it's wrong for us not to give back. Right. So when I see that, when I, when I see us as young men of color and we see a young man that may be moving a certain way that we know good and well, that's the wrong way. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's, right. it's wrong for us not to say, Hey man, stop. Right. You're going the wrong way. Right. It's wrong. Yeah. You know, it's wrong. But what we like to do is we like to posture up on one another. Mm -hmm. So when we want to give each other some help, mm -hmm. we think we're giving some some, you know, let's get down. Right, right, right. And we need to change that right, posture. Right, right. So the Black and Brown Male Summit, that's one of the goals is we need to change the way we see each other and the way we communicate to one another. Right. You know? Yeah. And so with that being said, what books or what what individual that you've you've kept in the minds in your mind when you move just keeps you just thinking is you know what this is the way I need to go this is a good way you know, you know? Uh, one book that comes to mind for me would be a book by Joy DeGruy Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome yes. and that's something that we actually had to read in the Mosher program mm -hmm. um, and, and it speaks about that philosophy that Nelson Mandela had uh, mm -hmm. reach one teach one mm -hmm. And I feel like, I mean, that's extremely important. I mean, why I'm here today is because of you guys. Mm -hmm. You guys are the older generation, and you are to set the path for me, and I'm to do the same mm -hmm. for the next generation, you mm -hmm. know? And that's the most, I feel like that's one of the most critical parts that we need in our communities. And that's what the Black and Brown uh, Summit offers, is for um, healthy role models in our communities to be able to say, hey, this isn't necessarily the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have, <clears throat> when you have a, a parent that's providing for a whole household and you have one parent and they're constantly working and like you said before, that child could be babysitting at home, you know, what is he doing with that time? Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't have a, a parent to necessar necessarily influence him in the way that he needs to go, so he has friends, mm -hmm. right? And kids teaching kids probably ain't the healthiest thing you can possibly get. Mm -hmm. So it, it's definitely important and I feel like it's critical for us to move forward as a people to have, you know, the older generation constantly mentoring us and, and giving us that wisdom of how we should move. You know, I, I meet plenty of people my age, you know, and they're just, they're in a spot where it's just like, man, you know, if, if you would have had a dad, right, or if you would have had a, a, a role model, a healthy role model there for you, you definitely wouldn't be in the spot that you are in now. So I, fi I constantly find myself mentoring people my age, you know what I mean? And, it's not something that I want to do, but I understand it's something that we have to be able to communicate with each other. We have to be able to educate each other. And, and I've been, I had the luxury to be educated. You know, I met you guys. It was a blessing for that. And now that I get the knowledge, I'll harness that knowledge and I'll try to give it back to people in my community um, in general. And within that line, I think that the biggest portion of that is that growing up, 
I never really had the environment that I would call home. Mm -hmm. So what he said was, I went out there to go look for my own home. Because if you don't have something of your own, you said, screw it, I'm going to go and build my own home. And that's what I went out there to go do. And growing up, there was this little seminar discussion that was taking place in middle school. And it's called the Lion Game. And you start within the line with everybody else, and they read out certain things that may or may not apply with you. For example, they would say, take a step forward if you grew up with both parents in the household. Mm -hmm. When this seminar was taking, when this uh, little activity was taking place, I was in the back of the line. Mm -hmm. I had nothing. I was in the back, and I was all by myself. And I felt like I was not of value because everybody else was up ahead. And I asked myself, I'm like, wait, why am I in the back? Is it because I lack of what they are asking me? Or is it because I have much more that they're not asking me? <clears throat> and growing up, we did the exact same line game in church. It was a similarity. And maybe say it's about three or four years that has passed now. And the exact same questions were read out. And I noticed that I moved 10 steps forward than I was last time. And it wasn't because I didn't, it wasn't because I tried to progress myself and be a better person. It was because I was exposed to new light. Um, all that I've known was darkness and meeting, you no know, service, meeting you and knowing that there are people out there who cares about these younger generations that are trying to create a change because where we're at right now is not where we need to be. We need to be at a better place. And seeing that people like you are taking the initiative to do that with the younger generation and teaching them and saying, hey, you're going towards this direction, but that is not where you want to go. Let us steer you. And that's why I'm really proud of this Black and Brown Summit was created, because it helps enlighten those people who think they already know. And like Bruce has said, how are you supposed to fill up your cup if, you, if it's already full? You know, mm -hmm. If you think you already know everything, how are you supposed to learn anything? Mm -hmm. And a, a great line that goes within that with basketball is that it says one man can be a crucial ingredient on a team, but one man cannot make a team. And, and real quick, I want to clarify, and because I, I, I feel like this is really important. I, 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 what we're all not saying, right, is that there is any problem with black people, mm -hmm. right? I, I just want you know I want to make sure that's clear. Mm -hmm. I feel like the problem is the systems that are in place that are um, that are um, pressed upon black people, mm -hmm. and and the importance of the Black and Brown Summit is not to get black people better, like a treatment or, or an ointment for our, for our blackness. I feel like the importance of this summit is to educate us on how we can uh, arise above the systems that are in place. You know, there's, there's tons of things that the systems do to us that directly affect us, and we have to learn as men of color how we fight the system mm -hmm. in, a, in a positive way, and not in a self-destructive way or in a way where we just say, screw it, right, let's do our own thing and, you know, but to give us a way to fight. And, and that's what the Black and Brown Summit is, is you guys equip us. You give us the weapons and the tools with, with education, right, with a book in the hand instead of a sword. Mm -hmm. You give us that power for us to understand how, okay, you know what, when me and Jordan and Joe uh, go to these places that are racist, how do we deal with these situations? Mm -hmm. Do we cuss them out? Do we slap the owner, right? Because <laughs> that, that's something that came to my mind, right? <laughs> but, but what we do is talk to the manager. <laughs> Let him know we won't stand for this, yeah. right? And, and get the community involved to this, uh, involved in it so that we can, we can radically change the system. And I'm not saying we're going to change everything, right? right? But at least we, we do it the right way instead of the wrong way. I know that's right. Yeah. And I am thinking I have to piggyback off you guys with that, uh, with the book, mm -hmm. Dr. Joy Guru, mm -hmm. me and... Rashad, so I think we saw it together first first time in San Diego, and um, well, you talked about the systems, and the first thing that came to my mind was about what she talked about in the book about being racist and about us as black people don't have the ability to be racist because we can't affect a total group of people. We can't affect no no we can't affect nobody else, no other race from going to get a car loan, a house loan, you know, but we do have the ability to be prejudiced. And we have to like and in in that I was thinking how do we like how do we channel that? Right. Like how do we? Cha I mean, it's. I mean, just listening to you guys right today talking about what happened in the restaurant, I'm like, I'm. You know how I am about you guys. I'm like, <laughs> man, why y'all ain't call me? Right. And I wasn't gonna do nothing, right. but just tell you guys, just yeah. just get out of there. Right. But I'm glad you guys handle it, and that lets me know that with uh, the things that we're doing and. If, you know, we can talk to people all day, we can preach out and we can talk, hey, you should do, but if we're not setting that example by the way we live and the things that we do, that those words are irrelevant. So and I'm glad you guys handled it that way. And I would like to think that 
it, it had to do with Rashad, me, and a lot of more other ones that yeah. wrote that you guys are like, you know, because sometimes I've had to say, man, how will, how will my granddad handle this? Like, you want to, you, you know, because I know I want to, like, lash out, but you know what that's going to do? It's going to only cause more problems. So right. when talking about that book, um, that was the book that, that book, st- it's like it's like my second Bible. It's in my bag. It's, it's with me. It's in my bag. Like, it goes everywhere with me. Right. So I can just refer back to it. And, it help, and not for, and this thing here, one thing I like about the black and brown is we have to be careful on how, we're empowering. The black and brown empowers our people in a in a positive aspect. Not because some people get militant and get angry right. and say, you know what? Yeah. Right. Well, we about to go, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and know your rights, but the black and brown doesn't do that. It actually empowers in that positive way where kids walk out of there feeling good about themselves. Right. And who I mean, who doesn't want to be a part of something like that and give back? I mean, a lot of things have been given back to me, you know, because I, I don't even supposed to be sitting right here where I'm in, I am today. But that's one thing that I like about the summit. So, yeah. Well, I would just say this. That was, thank you for your, I, I love how authentic you are. You, you know what I'm saying? I think that that's something that is beauty. That's beautiful to see how authentic you are. Right. You know, and I will let you know that the black and brown, when, when I look at the black and brown male summit and I look at all the young men that are here, one thing that I want them to leave with is I want you all to learn how to respond rather than react. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? Just right. respond. Right. And when you respond, you mm. know, that's when 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 society the the society um, inequities amongst people of color against people of color, when you respond, you you allow yourself to be present in that situation. Right. Where when you react, you're not truly present. You're not there. You're you're, you're reacting in a sense where your 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 fuel that you're reacting with it runs out fast. Right. It runs out real fast. Right. You it's gonna react. It's emotions. It's gonna run out. You know, ha! Ah! Right. And then you're like, right. I'm tired. Like, right. I'm done. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm done. My fuel's right. done. Like, right. I, I didn't show my, my my chest. I didn't show my fist. Right. But when you respond, you're present. Right. You're present because you you really took time to have to dive into the situation and really to to um like peel it. Right, like an uh, onion. You know, you you peel that onion, you start crying. Right. right, because you start crying in a sense where you start to get to that 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 the root. Right, and you start to be like, man, this is this is serious. Right, you know, and so with the black and brown, I want I I, I envision it to be a, a place where it's not just a moment, but it's a movement where we move mm, our like our that. young men to 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 be a part and be present in conversations in the schools. Right, so when I go to these schools right now. I try to get them to become present. Right. And like you said, right. it's not their fault. This isn't a black and right. brown fault. This, I'm right. not born and saying our black and brown kids. I'm, no, they just need to be present within their 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 the system that they're in. Right. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're in a game right now. Right. You know. And teach them to understand. Oh that. man, right. you're in a cold right. game. Right. Big. Mm-hmm. And I told like I was at this school the other day. You in a chess game. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you ever played chess, mm-hmm. there are many pieces. Them pieces can move any way. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You can they move any way they mm-hmm. can. Mm-hmm. Any and and most of the time, most of the time, them pieces are moving five times ahead of the, the move that they need to move. Right. That you know what I'm saying? Right. I don't know if I said that right, but you know, you, you think beyond. Right. You think five steps ahead. Right. Exactly. And so we need to get our kids to start thinking five steps ahead. Right. 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 You know, that's what the goal is at the black and brown. Right. So when you look at those young men, right. that's what I'm trying to get them to understand. You got to move five steps ahead. Right. You know, think five steps ahead. You have to. You know, you have, you have to. to. And it's not, it's not because you're black or brown. Mm-hmm. That's life. That right. True. That's yeah. life. True. Right. You know what I'm saying? Everybody else is doing it. Why can't you jump on? Right. Exactly. Right. You know, what makes you, what makes you different? Right. 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 You should be able to jump on. Right. You know, so just at, at just... And, and what would you say, like, just the benefit of, of one thing that you just gained from, you know, attending school? Like, you know, a lot of our, one thing that we have to understand, too, is everybody's not made for school. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, this is, everybody's not made for it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, right. but those who are questioning, who, who, who may be made for it, they need to hear. Like, what is it? What is that one thing that you gain from school that, just, you know, it just clicks? 
That's a really good question. From school, I have learned how to carry myself. I have learned who I am, I have learned how to identify myself, and I have learned how to react, mm -hmm. rather, respond. how to respond mm -hmm. rather than react. Mm -hmm. And that's what school has taught me. Although, although, although in sitting in classes, hearing the professors uh, teach me, although I'm getting all that information of knowledge, it is up to me how I use that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you know, on Sunday I went to church and the pastor was preaching, he said, God worked through you to increase you, so therefore you can be a blessing to other people to increase them also. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to all races. There is no discrimination, there's no discrimination when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. And with school, it has taught me how to carry myself because at first I used to think it's me, 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 I need to do this for myself. But now I'm thinking, okay, if it's just me and I move on and I go to the afterlife, then what's next? Mm -hmm. There's nothing else. It's the end for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying to learn how to teach myself to make, to build a foundation, not for me, but for my future generation and for their future generation to build that foundation so that when I leave, they will say this foundation that was built here was built by Josephus Tolo and he did this and he helped this community and he helped them and he was not racist, he was not discriminated against anyone because this man loved every single body with his heart. And that's what school has done for me. It has, it has taught me how to carry my identity with me. And regardless of where I go, who I am, I'm always gonna be me and I'm always gonna keep it real. Mm. I love that talk. Yeah. So, so as far as school and school, you know, is applied, I feel like school and education could be two different things. Mm -hmm. However, I feel like college I definitely gives, a, gives you education. Um, I feel like the biggest thing about college, for me personally, I feel like it's the opportunities. Um, so they give you, of course you get the knowledge and the book and, and all that good stuff, but I feel like the opportunities that come with college is probably one of the most important things that, that people, African Americans specifically, we need. You know, they give a lot of, they give a lot of support in a lot of different areas where we need to be educated at. I know for me, um, when I was in high school, I didn't take it serious at all. I was just kind of there. I was, you know, I was working on my music. I was like, man, I'm about to be a mega star. Bump all this. I don't care about none of this. Still I'm, I'm still a star. <laughs> but but uh, I, I definitely didn't take education serious. I used to have people do my homework for me. I mean, that's, I didn't take school serious at all. And I definitely didn't think I was going to college. I mean, I just wasn't, that wasn't my personality type. I knew I was smart, but I didn't need college to tell me how to be smart. I'm already smart, <laughs> the, the mindset that I had. But, but uh, when I humbled myself, and um, I, was, I went to a couple different jobs, and I remember I was stacking bags at, at the airport at Menzies. You know, a, a lot of people probably know what this job is. It's right down the street at the airport. Right. I remember I was stacking these bags, and there was old dudes in the plane with me, probably 60 years old, 50 years old, stacking bags. Mm. And I looked at them, and they were kind of ripped and stuff, but I was like, I don't want that to be me. When I get that age, I don't want that to be me, making $13 an hour and I'm 50, 50 years old, mm -hmm. and, and the boss treats you like you're a, a child, right. you know, regardless of you know, what race you are, mm -hmm. um, that's not gonna be me. Yeah. So immediately after, I enrolled in school, and the opportunities they gave me, like they constantly educated me, me meeting you guys, I mean, I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. You know, um, anybody, I'll tell them to go to school. Mm -hmm. Anybody, go to a community college minimum. Right. See, you, see, fill it out, right. you know what I mean? But um, I feel like it's, 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 it's really important. And for those of us that are you know, black and brown, we have, to, we have to step our game up. We don't have the luxury to sit back and say, I will be okay, I'm gonna get this job or that job, because you know, we're, we're slighted, right. right? The scale is not even, and statistics shows this. Right. You know, it's unfortunate, but it's the reality of life. So that means we have to work harder. You know what I mean? We have to step our game up. We have to be those to take initiative and think five steps ahead because even if the other boy ain't thinking five steps ahead, right, right. he gonna get five steps exactly. ahead regardless, yeah. and you ain't. So you gotta, you gotta be able to move now. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, I feel like that's one of the things that's important. Right. For that's them. good. Yeah, well, college, for, and I was listening to what you guys said, and I always say that college doesn't teach you, tell you what to think, it teaches you how to think. And so me coming from this end, and Rashad, I know, because me and Rashad have been dealing for some time now, um, coming from that student aspect to now a teacher, you know, a professor aspect, and going here and being an advisor with you guys and doing all these other things, college has, I mean, you know, we know the catchy terms, access, and, 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 that's, and that's fine. But I met, like, I met so many wonderful people while I was in college, whether I was sitting in the classroom or whether I'm in front of people teaching, but I've learned so much from you guys that books could never, like mm. the stuff that I got from you, like in you and you, books, 
they're not in the books. Right. Like, I don't, I don't know if they'll ever be in the books because I read a lot of books and I haven't, those experiences there, you can't, like, we was in, uh, we was at UC Davis, remember? Man, we walked to like 12, 30, and 1 just talking on a college campus of UC Davis in California. We was in Sacramento, and we were just talking about just like people were walking by us and looking like, why is these young black, what are they, what are they doing? Right. We, wasn't, we wasn't getting in any trouble. Right. We wasn't like, we wasn't drinking. We wasn't doing, we were just talking about knowledge, the Bible, and books, and that stuff. You can't like, those kind of things right there. You have to value those for the, what they're worth, because in in reality, we all won't be here all the time. But it's little things like that 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 matter. And so, college college has gave me those relationships that uh, I never thought I would have. And it's not on a system that we're we're friends because because what I can do for you right. or what you can do for me right. or vice versa. Mm-hmm. I tell, we always talk about this all the time. Mm-hmm. Like you need me, I'm here. Mm-hmm. No attachments, nothing. Let's right. make it happen. Right. So that's my experience from college. Right. Oh man, yeah. I, I mean, that's, and I would tell you this, that this has, this has been, you know, I've been in some jobs. I've been in some, some, some careers. I've, I've, I've been working with you for the last, you know, I would say 10 years. You know, I had a job before this where I, I worked on a military base and I worked with youth whose parents were over in Iraq or in war. You know, those youth were uh, very um, empowering to me, you know, to see what they had to go through mm-hmm. and to see, you know, how they had the, that, that street game or that game was totally different from the game that I was giving them. And they gave me some rules in their own games too. Right. So we was like, it's just changing rules. Right. That was real cool, right, right. you know. And I work with you now, and you you're just changing rules with me too. Right. So I'm still learning. So don't ever think that you know you get to a certain right. age and right. you just stop learning. Right. You know that right. it never happens I like got that. It all. You know, like you got it all. Yeah. And I always right. tell the youth, you know, if you're the smartest one in your group. Your group is stupid. <laughs> but, right. Man, you're doing something wrong, man. You're doing something wrong. Right, so right. when you when you have an opportunity to really learn from a, some experienced individuals or from individuals who who walk that 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 walk, who who've been proactive and who learn who knows how to respond, who can teach you how to respond, then you gotta get you gotta sit down. Right. You gotta sit down. Right. You gotta sit down and listen. And I love your clarification, Chris, when you said that you know. It's not about going to school. It's about really, what are you getting from there? there like, right. what's the knowledge that you're receiving? Right. What's the, what the, what is the skill set? Right. You know, what skill set do you have? Right. You know, when these black and brown young boys come, I want the workshop presenters to really teach skill sets. You know, and that's another thing I want to just highlight at the Black and Brown Male Summit mm-hmm. is our workshop presenters. They're all local. Mm-hmm. These are local young men of color that come in and do this work. Mm. And people always ask you, Rashad, where's the big name? Where's, you know, who you gonna bring in? Right. I'm like, you know what? I'm bringing in my man right here. Right. Cause my man, that's a big name. Right. Not just that it's a big name. When these kids go out to the grocery store, they're gonna see him. Right. 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 You're gonna see him. Mm-hmm. And you're gonna recognize that he got his own business mm-hmm. or he works for another college mm-hmm. and we all in the same situation. Right. Right. We all want the same thing for you. Mm-hmm. Ain't no competition. There's no, some, some of these guys are coming back for the third and fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. You know, this is, th- th- these are local, local stars, right. you know. It's not until we, you know, I don't want to go big and go and go get, you know, the, the famous athlete. Not right. saying it's a bad thing, right. but then when you start writing that, people just come just for that. Right, and they right. miss out. They miss out. Exactly. They miss out on the meat. You know, you you here for the dessert. You ain't get no meat yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, truly, you, right, you, you, right. you 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 here to eat the dessert and then you about to leave. Right, you forget right. the whole meal. Right, right. You know, and I'm, I'm not about that. You about to you about to stay here and get some food. Right. You, you know, and you get the dessert at the end. Right, right. right. Some ice cream. Right. And <laughs> something that I actually learned um, from the Emoja program, you know, which is on college campus, is is you know what education is about. You know, the root word of education is to educe. And educe is to 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 bring out of, you know. I feel like that's that's different from from teaching somebody something. When you're teaching somebody something, I feel like you, that's more of your training. Right. 
right? You're training them how to react or how to respond to certain things. Whether education is to bring out that knowledge that's in everybody. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's, you know, a big part of the black and brown segment that it plays also is we want to educate people, not not train them, you know, or 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 impart knowledge in them, but we want to bring out that beauty, that that beautiful mind that we all have, mm -hmm. you know, that God's implanted inside of us. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, when you guys were referring to books, the first book I have ever picked up my whole entire life to read was the Bible. Mm. And it it did so much good for my soul and for me individually that I rethink my decision before I do it. It makes me think over and over, is this what I really want? Is this what I really need? Because there's a difference between what you want and what you need. And most people, they usually go for what they want rather right. than what they need. And I recommend that if you read the Bible, you're never going to be the same. I'm going to just leave it like that. You always going to be like, man, I know he's watching over my shoulder. <laughs> Somebody's always watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. You want to say something? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I agree. I think that reading in general, oh, yeah. it just stimulates your mind. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that it just, it does something to you when you read in some aha moments. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, you ever read the right. aha right. moment? Like, right. man, <laughs> like I love going out to the schools <laughs> right. and doing a PowerPoint on information that the students just have never heard of. Uh -huh. And they're just sitting there looking at me like, man. And they think I'm the smartest dude on earth. Yeah. And they're cracking me up like, nah, I, mean, I just read that. That's not for me. Right. But it's beautiful for them to think that, you know, man, I'm, I'm missing out on a lot. Right. You know? And these young boys, they, they are hungry. It's beautiful to go out to these schools and see how hungry they are just to, to have someone come in and, and truly be consistent of taking time to go in there and just have some bold discussions. Mm. Just having bold discussions, right. you know, and, and, and these discussions are around relationships, hmm. you know, um, parenting. Right, right, you know, right. I have a group right now of young boys at a school that's 15 young boys of color in this, in this group. And out of 15, 14 out of 15 have no fathers at home. Hmm. Hmm. So you can only imagine oh, yeah. the, the first time the interaction I had with them oh, yeah. where they were all over the place. Right. It's like they couldn't, they didn't know how to sit still. Mm. They didn't know that I, w I was there to help. It was almost not even help. I mean, just there to be, um, just to be present with them and have a conversation with them. They just didn't know how to act. Right. And it was until, it was, it was it until I asked them like, who has fathers at the house? Like, you know, and it just, you know, one person. Mm. And then when I asked them, how would you define yourself? Give me one word. They never, nobody, they, they don't know. They don't have a word. They just don't know how to look, to be introspective and really define themselves. So that's the first conversation I have with these young men. Let's define you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Don't let, allow people to define you. You define yourself. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? You define yourself. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you'd be amazed at these words. You know, these boys, I go back, they got courageous. Right. You know what I'm saying? They, they you know, um, respectful. Mm. You know, when, and then some stuff is, you know, it makes you, you know, pretty much emotionally. You, you become emotionally attached where a young boy said that he was depressed. You know? Mm -hmm. How you be depressed in eighth grade? Mm. Something great. Come on now, man. Yeah. You, you know, these, no, nah, yeah. shit, I don't stress. These kids got stress. Yeah. Right. You know, and and and, and that doesn't just that um, doesn't speak to just our young men of color. Okay. There's a lot of kids in the schools who are depressed. Oh yeah. But just coming from that circle right. that I work with, right. those are the conversations that we're having. Right. So, once again, the black and brown, it was it was constructed to help these young these young kids be more proactive for themselves, hmm. to be advocates for themselves. Right. And I love that you guys are advocates for yourself. Mm -hmm and to really be present in the moments of where they're at with yeah. one another. And I, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So through these years, you've done such a great job in which you and your team mm -hmm. with this Black and Brown Summit. Mm -hmm. I got two questions. Mm -hmm. First, what do you need help with mm -hmm. to continue this? Mm -hmm. And what do you see this summit in the next five years? Mm -hmm. Because I think both of those, and I tried to, I'm, I'm lining those up to be, you know, one, one question to support the other one. I got you. For longevity and for sustainability for you and for your team. And so, and what do you need from us 
uh, as a campus, if, if that makes it even better? And where do you see the summit in the next five or 10 years? Well, I'm, I'm, and that's a great question. Um, I envision the summit being um, a staple for the community okay. and especially for the college where I, will, I see this becoming like a three-day conference. Right. Okay. And I think there's a lot of individuals that, were not, that are not included just because of logistic-wise mm -hmm. in the day, of the, of the, in the time-wise right. of the event. We can't have all, everybody here on that Saturday, right. you know, just fire code wise. And then some people just can't get here on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Right. And there are some people we're missing amongst our younger youth and our adults. Right. So I would like to see us have a Thursday where we allow our eighth graders or seventh graders be present with themselves because that's a different conversation. Right. And I think that we need to start a little bit right. younger. Right. I think that the investment piece comes in a little bit younger. Right. So now when you invest a little bit younger, we can be, we, you know, we can be consistent with the summits where these kids, if we talk to you in eighth grade, mm -hmm. we know you come in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. We have you now. Right. We, we're investing. Right. And we continue to invest in these young youth, these young kids. Right. So on a Thursday, we do an eighth grade event. It's right. more controlled, 8.30 right. to right. 1. We have the same type of setup where we have workshop presenters. Right. Friday, I like to have us have a community forum where we really discuss with the community about how we can be more um, proactive in working with this population, while either it's in school or with our businesses. I think that's something that I would like to get in uh, more conversation at the table is businesses, local businesses around jobs. Exactly. You know? Exactly. That's big. I think right. that, you know, if you look at the, the, the employment for that population, it's very, it's very low. So we need to talk about what type of skill sets we need and for a business, for a community, well, how can we help this population? Right. You know, what can we do? Internships, what can we do? Exactly. And then that Saturday we come in with our summit, you know? So we keep it like a, a, a we make it truly a conference right. exactly. for all, right. you know? And the good thing is we added, the team and I, we added that parent and that adult um, piece with the summit on a Saturday. Right. Right. And that's been um, well received and they have their own sessions. Because at the summit, if you don't know, they're, they're, stay, they're, they're kept out of the workshops with the young men, right. just to keep it separate and to keep it um, where they can have their own discussions. Mm -hmm. And so I see the summit truly being a staple of the college. I too have a question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that you were teaching your eighth graders and they couldn't find that one word that kind of mm -hmm. summed up how they felt or who they were. Mm -hmm. And after several times went by and you were communicating and reflecting with these students in their lives, mm -hmm. they were able to come up with words. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's a student out there or anyone specifically who wants to come to the um, Summit Brown mm -hmm. and they don't know what it is that they're going to take within that, from within that seminar, What's one thing you could tell them out there that that's one thing for sure that they guarantee they're going to learn and it's going to change their life? What's that well, you're going to I would, Well, that's a great question. The summit, um, one thing that you will see, I think we're visual learners mm. right, right off the bat. Exactly. You know, where we, we, our kids, we, we usually go to where we see majority of us at. Gosh, and for example, for that is like sports. A lot of our young black and brown boys, we're football or basketball. Mm -hmm. Statistically and shown, we see that on TV. So visually, it's something that it gets to us. It just entices us. When you step on this campus, you see 500 black and brown young boys who look just like you, who are being fed the same information like you, and you see them engaged in conversations. That alone right there should sit with you. It should sit with you quickly to see, for you can see that there are others that look just like me who need the same fuel that I need. Right. And, we can, and, and we can get the same fuel. There's a place for that to happen. Right. Like, so there's no competition here. So we all can get the same right. fuel. Right. And we can all, you know, we can all drive off or we can all be successful at one time right. with the same fuel right. and it's good. And one thing that I, I would say that you would get from there, not just that, but um, just as far as a term that you're gonna get from here is you're gonna get empowered. I really believe that right now our young people of color, especially our young men, they're not empowered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like the, the, the streets doesn't empower them, the schools are not truly empowering them. They're, and it's not that they're victims, mm -hmm. but they're invisible. Mm -hmm. right. You know, it's almost like you walk in, 
but nobody really is talking okay. to you. Right. Right. So you, 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 you know, you, you in the, you, you in the area, they ain't really talking to you. Mm -hmm. right. You know, where we got to get them more engaged. We got to empower them and say, man, come be a part of this conversation. Right. Yeah, you come right. over here. Right. You just as important to anybody else. Right. You know, and when you talk about equity, equity, it's not just the instruction piece. It's like, man, it's the empowering piece. Mm -hmm. We are power over here. Why aren't you getting empowered? Right. You know, what? what's the reason for that? So I think that with that question, you, they're going to get empowered. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you go back around and ask them, what's that one word? Mm -hmm. I want that word to be, I'm, I'm empowered. Mm -hmm. You know, or I'm courageous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I have confidence. Right. You know, there's there's these words that are, are action words, mm -hmm. you know, that we can say that, you know what, you receive something, right. and now you're ready to respond. You know, so that's the beauty of the summit. Right. I cool. think that's that's the difference um, from you know the black and brown mm -hmm. and any other place that you go to just listen or, or talk about stuff that us as a people should to try to do. And mm -hmm. I mean, I've been to a ton of places where you where you go to these events and they want to talk about it, and mm -hmm. you know you're just there and you you just you talk. I mean, that's mm -hmm. all it is. It's really it's talk. Mm -hmm. But you know, the black and brown summit. It sounds like it's something that's very much. Um, intentionally involved in the community. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's if you if you do a whole lot of talking and a whole lot you know and, and not enough walking, then it's kind of like what's the point, mm -hmm. you know? And here, this is not a place where you just want to go and talk about it, but this is a place where we empower you mm -hmm. to show you how you can take advantage of this mm -hmm. and how you can you know actually put this into action mm -hmm. wherever you go, mm -hmm. you know. So like the perfect example, how you got how you got people in the community that's already there teaching, mm -hmm. that's already walking. Right, because this person can run in this person there, they can get together and move on from there. It's not like we're just coming together and talk about how we feel yeah. and our emotions, but it's how we can be empowered and how we can actively use this in our communities. Yeah. That's what I like about it the yeah. most. And in addition to that, it, this empowerment is not just something that's gonna last you for a day or so. You know, mm -hmm. like like what Sha said, it's a fuel that we give you, and that fuel is everlasting. You take that empowerment with you wherever you go, and you you show that empowerment because you have established that empowerment from the Black and Brown Summit, mm -hmm. and you take that empowerment and you go ahead and you empower other people, and you start a chain of movement. And by the time you start that chain of movement, by the time you notice exactly what you're doing and you're actually aware of what's going on, everybody's going to be empowered. Mm -hmm. Just like the reference from the Bible, it says that the fish in, on the boat was overfilling, mm -hmm. but Jesus took that fish and he added on the, another boat. And it didn't say that the boat that already had the first fish was half empty or half full. It says both boats were full. And mm -hmm. that's because it was that everlasting empowerment. Mm -hmm. So if you think that if you're going to have that empowerment just for one day or two weeks and then you're going to be filling back to the... It doesn't work that way, you know. That empowerment is always going to be over there, and that feels is going to be everlasting feel. Mm -hmm. And man, come what's through. The, what's that parable, man? What's the reach? What's the reach? No, no. So, so I'm going to say, <laughs> tell them, tell them, no, tell them. What's that? What is it? Is that um, I can teach you how to fish, or no, I if can, you teach a person how to fish, you will feed them forever. But yeah. if you give a person a fish, you will feed them for a day. There you go. So we try, we try to teach her how to fish. Right. So you, yeah, yeah, you go. I, I, I know it was something. I didn't yeah. want to mess it up, but that's it right there. It's like, man, let us teach you how to fish. Right. Amen. You know, let us let us teach you how to fish. Oh, and, yeah. it, and it, and you know, I want to go back to what we first started because, you know, I love that when you and you did your introduction and you said you are a father and a brother. Oh yeah. And I'm a father. I'm a father of two boys mm -hmm. and a girl. You know, ten, eight, and seven. And I look at my boys and I just know how important it is for them to see um, real, real work within the community. Like, you know, to, to get that give back right. and that, that ultimate respect, not just as a, a, a father, but just as a, a, a man in your community. Oh, yeah. Like, you got to give back. You know you what I'm saying? To. It's like, man, you just... It just, it's a feeling that you just have, you know. It's like, you, know, you gotta get it back, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It just, it, it just, it just wrong for, for you to just have, like, so much, you know, knowledge or, or just the, the experience that can help someone else. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I just felt you just gotta give, oh, yeah. you know. And, and, you know, being an athlete and, and playing a position as a point guard, you know, in, in basketball, that's something, I mean, 
you dish it. <laughs> you know, you dish it. Like, man, you, you, win yeah, games, you win more games, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, hey. But you now, everybody in the game. Yeah, everybody, you, every, everybody, everybody, everybody got to get in the game, everybody, man. Everybody want to be Kobe. Right. Right, but can't shoot like that. Man. <laughs> if you dish the ball, right. man. man. Your point guard got 30 points, and right. everybody else got two right. to three. Right. Something wrong. Now, look, I ain't going to go in my stats, <laughs> but I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I, no, 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 no. I didn't go. Yeah, I ain't going to go in my stats. I didn't pass a lot, but. When I did, I yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't go on my stats, but I would just say that, you know, just growing up as a point guard, your first right. instinct was you give first. Right. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You, you got to give first. You got to right. kick it. And it feels good to see somebody else score. Oh, yeah. right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it feels good to be able to go out there and just be like, hey, man, you're going to shoot the rock. Right. And then right. when the kids shoot it, and it's like, they had that awakening that you know, oh, I can shoot. Oh, like, yeah. You, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, you oh, better, yeah. you better go on take that. Oh, yeah. yeah, you better go on take that shot. <laughs> shot. Right. And it feels right. good. And right. it just right. feels good, man. And, right. and one thing that's, you know, I'm a visual learner also. Mm -hmm. So how I envision it, it's kind of like a stream, or a river, mm -hmm. right? And the moment that that stream is blocked up, it becomes distilled water. Mm -hmm. And what happens to distilled water is that you can't drink it no more. And, 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 and it's, it's full of, you know, all these different type of germs and bugs and stuff because it's not constantly moving. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're, when you're a stream that's constantly moving, it's mm -hmm. going into different bodies of water connected, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's where, that's kind of like us, right. right? We have to constantly be pouring out into different people in different avenues because it opens up our experience um, and it opens up our opportunities. Right. And mm -hmm. so it's reach one, teach one, and you mm -hmm. keep that stream going. Don't block it off because that's actually unhealthy for you. Mm -hmm. Study actually shows this. Right. You know, yeah. you want to be closed off and, and shut up. Okay, but what about when you need somebody? Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to lend this brother five bucks. <laughs> so now you down and out, <laughs> right? But you don't isolated yourself. So now what? Mm -hmm. and, and it's not even just about money, but it's emotional connection with other people mm -hmm. also. You know, these, these children, these people out here, they need us. Mm -hmm. And this is a time when they need us. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's up to us. What are we going to do? Right. right? Are we going to be like, oh, well, they, you know, I see they need help, but I'm going to do me and focus on me with this individualistic mindset, mm -hmm. right, and just do my own thing, or am I going to go down, educate these brothers about how, how to operate, right, and move in these certain areas and connect them to me? And who knows? Mm -hmm. You know, one of these young men can open up a door for you later on in the future. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you never know. So yeah. it's important to keep the stream moving mm -hmm. because if you block it off, it becomes unhealthy, yeah. right, and it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Nobody can drink from it. Right? If you do, you get sick from it. You don't want to be a sick person, right? right. So exactly. to be a healthy person is being part of a community. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's part of it. And it's good. I like you said that about uh, helping them. Because, I, you know, I got two boys, too, and uh, two sons. And, it, like, I know I don't like to be celebrated for the things that I should do. Right. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm saying that right. Oh, right. No, 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 you know what I'm saying? Good. Good. I should do that. Right. Mm. Like, I don't... Tell a lot of people, I don't baby, I, I never got to the point, you yeah. know, people be like, I got to, you know, I got to keep the kids. It's never been like that right. from day one. Right. It's never been a job. It's never been a duty. Right. They're, they're, and, and a lot of people see me now, they see my kids with me, my son is playing ball, my daughter's with me a lot, but this is the way it's been. It's not like I'm trying to make up and there's nothing wrong with making up, right. but it is something that I wanted to do. And to say all that, that we can do for it's, it it takes it when we're doing for our own that is cool that's what we're supposed to do right. but the effort and the sacrifice is to go out to these young boys and give back to these young boys because what my sons have what your sons have and daughter have what your son you know they don't have that you know what i mean right. some of these kids don't have that right. and so this is what we're doing so sometimes my son has attended all of the the um the black and brown since i've been here and you know and that's good but a lot of things i look at and he enjoys it mm -hmm. but a lot of those kids that he's in sessions with he comes home and i ain't never told you that he's like he this is where I get the most love from him after the black and brown. Like, I, and Christmas, and his birthday. Because he, he's coming home, he was like, Dad, I was just talking to some of the guys that he, he never met. It's like, man, they don't, like I was telling them about, like, you're at my games, and the, uh, you know, we went on a vacation, and, you know, I got my own room, and I got, you know, and not just about what you have, but most importantly, we have been fishing, and you know I try to fish so yeah. much, you know. Yeah. But that time mm -hmm. that a lot of these boys don't have. And so I put myself in that 
position because I understand that growing up with my dad not being around. And so I try to ask these boys when I'm the caucus leader, man, what do you guys need? Like, what do you, like, what do you guys need? And if it's possible for me to get a fishing trip to take you guys, because that right there means a lot. That means so much. We, we did a, we did an activity uh, in California about it put all of us in one line. Mm -hmm. And it said, if, you, if your dad ever took you fishing, it was questions like this. Take two steps forward. Mm -hmm. Next question. If you have a relative that's incarcerated, mm -hmm. take two steps back. Mm -hmm. So these questions started going on and on and on. You know, did you ever have to come home to a, a house when nobody was there? Mm -hmm. Take two steps back. That's the same one you was going through. That's the exact same one. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it, it was so amazing how spread out we were at the end. Mm -hmm. And it was people that I had been in a conference with talking to the whole time. But when we started asking those, they started asking those questions about the things that you was exposed to as a kid and stuff. And then you start talking about privilege mm -hmm. because we always think about white privilege. Mm -hmm. and pro you know what? It's a privilege for us to be sitting oh, yeah. here. Oh yeah. yeah. It's a privilege for oh, us yeah. to be, it's a privilege for you to have the black and brown. It's a privilege for those boys to get a chance to come to the black and brown. And so that's why I asked about what do you need mm -hmm. to keep this going? Mm -hmm. Because we want to actually give everybody else that's coming behind that same yeah. privilege. Right. Yeah. Well, I would say this, and we, and we, I have to, and we have to thank Highline College, though, All right. Right. And, right. and President Jack Birmingham exactly. and his leadership with the board, with the right. exec staff, on down from um, faculty who have been involved, all those individuals with Jack Birmingham's leadership, Dr. Jack Birmingham's leadership, our president, right. he has allowed this to be a part of the college. Exactly. A lot of presidents not doing this. Right, right. You know, you don't see a lot of colleges having the um, the 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 programs that speak to specific populations like this. Right, right. You know, right. you just don't have it. Right. You know, not only do we have the black and brown, we have the Yale. Right. You know, that speaks to our young women of color, mm -hmm. and that's a young, educated ladies leading, and that's a beautiful yeah. summit in itself. Because the ladies were like, we need something. <laughs> but what's, what's going on? What is going on? So ladies, we, we got that. That's right. our second year, third year coming up this year. Um, and then, you know, we have our um, SEED. Then we have um, our Southeast Asian Coalition. We have individuals on this campus that have programs for that specific population. Mm -hmm. um, faculty and staff members who are on a coalition for that Southeast Asian population. Mm -hmm. We have our uh, Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. They just had their program. Um, you know, we, we, you, 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 so you see the importance of um, certain subgroups having specific programs. Yeah. You know, our access for our students with disabilities, that's one. We have our veterans, we're trying to put, they're, they're trying to put an event together. So there's events that are going on that the college has taken note and have stepped out of that comfort zone and just had these events for these specific populated right. Um, right. groups, which you can't speak to from a lot of other colleges. Exactly. Right. So I just really give thanks to um, the, the leadership that we have here at the college that allowed this to happen, and now it be its sixth year. And you know, you have individuals coming from, last year we had individuals coming from north of Seattle, eastern Washington, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Portland, Oregon, I mean, this is big, right. and this allows Highline to be put on a map where they're 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 very um, inclusive about what they're doing um, in regards to um, the support for the communities that they serve, and plus they 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 take that um, that lead in having programs such as this, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, what what do we need? We just need that that continued leadership oh, yeah. from the college. That's all we need. We need their continued leadership from the college. I, if we get that, everything else will follow. You know, because you get to let you you have to allow it to happen first, mm -hmm. and then everything else will follow. Mm -hmm. You know, so right. man, this has been good. <laughs> no, right. this has been good. This has been this has been good. We can right. we can we can truly eat on this. <laughs> we can eat on this. This know, is good, right? man. It's been. It's like, I don't know, I forgot the cameras in front of us, to be honest right. with you. You know, so I just say, this, let's just end it with some words of wisdom. Like, what is it that we want to end it with 
with if we were to just let our young young men know, um, you know, what is it that you just want them just to hear and just to be encouraged about? Just give just give them some a tidbit of wisdom before we leave, and then we can sign off. So who's first? I'm gonna go first. Okay. Um, one thing that, and I'll be very brief. One mm -hmm. thing that I would give our young kids and. Um, coming from my past experience is that never, and it is simple, is to never give up. And mm -hmm. the reason why I can say never give up because I'm a living witness mm -hmm. on uh, people that gave up on me. I didn't graduate initially from high school. Mm -hmm. So I all, this was, it's extra for me. And it took people believing in me and me working hard. And so, you know, a lot of times people tell you that hard work doesn't pay off. Well, mm -hmm. no even if it just makes you feel good in yourself to say that, you know, I did that. You know, I did, with the help of God, I did that. And so mm -hmm. the, the words that I would give them is to never give up. Mm -hmm. Never give up. It is behind our pain, it is purpose. Mm -hmm. It is purpose behind our pain. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just say that, you know, speaking from what Torius is talking mm -hmm. about, I know that we've been through a lot as a people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, and not just talking about slavery, but even some of the things that are that, that we experience now. Um, and and there's two things that I learned that you could do with pain, mm -hmm. right? One of them is you can let it consume you, yeah. right? And you can you can disappear like you were talking about and become mm -hmm. invisible. Or the second option is to take that pain and use it as fuel, yeah. and use that fuel so you can fight harder, and and get through those things that that are that are constantly pushing you back, yeah. right? And get through adversity and get through get through all these things that, that want to overcome you, but you can use this to get to a better place. You know, say, you know what, I've been poor before. I won't be poor in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna work hard to get out of this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna work hard to provide for my family. You know what, I didn't have a dad, but you know what, I'm gonna be a better father. Mm -hmm. Use that as fuel and as power instead of becoming a victim to it. Mm -hmm. Don't just say, you know what, I ain't never had a dad, so forget it, I ain't gonna be a dad, I'm gonna be absent. But to encourage them, empower them, and tell them to use this pain that we have as a people, but use it in a positive way where we can use it as a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, words of encouragement, I'm going to just say this as if I was talking to my son um, who's not here with us today and I know he's in a better place but I was born in Africa and I keep on saying that because I want it to stick in your head to know where I have come from, where I have traveled. I want you to look, take a look at my footprint that I have come, the, tra the travel that I have come through and I'm here today. And it doesn't matter where you come from, it matters where you're going. Mm -hmm. And as long as you have a plan, and it doesn't even have to be a good plan, you just gotta know exactly what you want out of life. Mm -hmm. And Highland Community College or Highland College provides that. We have love, we show you love, mm -hmm. we give you love. If you don't have anything else but love, we give you that. Mm -hmm. And that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. If you love somebody and somebody loves you back, cause love is not jealousy, mm -hmm. love is not hatred, Love is not envy. Love is nothing but pure, mm -hmm. pure love. And when we give you that love, nobody can take that away from you, mm -hmm. no matter what. So if you want to know why or any words of encouragement, I love you and I love everybody. Mm -hmm. And there's love that we need and there's love that we're going to give. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that um, to my young men of color, um, I would just say be patient. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we're, we're quick to, to move or we're quick to be upset when somebody's talking. And I tell always to always tell people is that you shouldn't be upset that somebody's talking to you. You should be upset when nobody's talking to you at all. Mm -hmm. When nobody's talking to you. That's when you should be upset. Mm -hmm. You know? So just be patient. Um, I would say um, stay the route. Just stay the route that is provided to you from these individuals um, that are workshop presenters at the Black and Brown Male Summit or just from those community leaders that you run into or that you engage with in your classroom or any of your other settings that you're, that you're privileged to, to speak with in a circle. Mm -hmm. and I would just say be patient, hold on to their words, and really go for a movement, not a moment. Mm -hmm. And when you go for a movement, the only thing that separates a movement from a moment is just courage. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's courage. That's it. And I would just say thank you again for Highline College for really just the support that you've had with all the summits, especially our Black and Brown Male Summit. I would say thank you for you brothers for just taking time to really just to have a nice little dialogue. 
this is this has been good. You know, it's been real good, and I love you, brothers, man. And, I, and I'm looking forward to um, to re just continuing our relationship. You know, and, and just being a part of wherever it's about to take us. Wherever it's going to go down, it's going to go down. But I know it's going to go down with some love. That's right. That's it. Right. That's it. Right. All right. All right. Thank you.